Good morning, everybody. We'll just uh, get the volume sorted out here. Uh, welcome. My name is Tim McGray, and I'm the executive director of the museum. On behalf of the team here at the museum, I'd like to thank you all for coming to this morning's presentation. But before we get started, just a couple of things I'd just like to sort of share with you. Um, our next speaker series is going to be December 13th, and it will be the, the noted automotive historian Bob Devlin. Uh, Bob's going to talk to us about the, the Golden Gate Park road races that happened between 1952 and 1954 in San Francisco. Um, and then we are working on our 2015 series, and the website will have those, the, the spring dates, um, and who we have featured, and then we're working on the fall dates. So look out for those. Um, a couple of other activities we have going on at the museum here towards the end of the year. Um, this is the 14th year that the European train enthusiasts are going to come to the museum. Uh, the display opens the Friday after Thanksgiving, November 28th, um, and it runs through January 4th. If you haven't seen it, and you think you're passionate about cars, meet some people who are passionate about small trains. Um, they do a wonderful display. It's open every day, and it's, it's included in the museum admission. Um, each, for those of you who may not be aware, each month on the first Sunday of the month, we do an event down in the plaza called Cars and Coffee. Um, if you haven't been, it's really simple. Um, you come when you want, you leave when you want, you drive what you want, and we hand you a cup of coffee. Um, after that, you have to manage your own expectations. We do not promise you a parking space. <laughs> um, the official times are 8 to 10. As I said the last time I spoke to the group, um, we seem to attract insomniacs. Um, we do get some early arrivals, um, but you're more than welcome to come. And, and both in November and December, Cars and Coffee, we are doing a food drive to benefit the Contra Costa and Solano County food banks. Um, so if you're heading that way and you've got something that you can donate to their cause, that would be greatly appreciated. If you like what we do here at the museum, um, you like our events or, or you just like old cars, um, and you're not a member, please consider becoming a member. Um, we really do appreciate each and every one of our members. Um, we think that we put together a, a year-round group of events that provides value to the membership. Um, if you are a member, don't stop there. Convince a friend, buy one for a family member, all of the above. And then before you leave, um, don't forget to go through our gift store and see if there's anything there we can entice you with. So anyway, um, our speaker this morning, Rafi Manassian a widely published automotive designer, illustrator, writer, historian, and a Pebble Beach Concorde d'Elegance class winner. His impressive 20 plus year career includes aircraft interior designs for Boeing, toy designs for Mattel and McDonald's, consumer product designs for Honeywell, Polaris, and Rainbird, and car designs for Toyota, Subaru, Mold Coach Builders, and the Franklin Mint. Rafi's automotive work has been featured on World of Wheels, Speed Vision Network, TLC Rides, and the Fine Living Network. Rafi has achieved the Award of Excellence from Car Styling Magazine and was part of the design build team for the 2005 America's Most Beautiful Roadster winner, Seduced, and published the first Ferrari hybrid concept in 2008. He has authored articles for Auto Week, High Performance Mopar, the Diecast Magazine, and his designs have been featured in Car Styling, Forza, and Automobile Magazine. A pioneer professor in the California College of Arts Design MBA program, Rafi teaches industrial design and innovation and is a noted speaker at corporate events on design, innovation, and the creative process. Rafi devotes much of his professional energy to educational programs for young people interested in careers in arts, music, and the humanities. Earlier this year, he was appointed chairman of the board of Zoo Labs, an Oakland, California organization to committed to finding fresh ways of supporting creative careers. Rafi lives on the West Coast with his wife and two children, where he maintains a modest collection of full-size cars and obsessive collection of model cars. Fred, you're not alone. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Rafi Manassian.
Well, thank you, everyone. I am pleased to be here today, and I frequently uh, work with docents here at Black Hawk Museum. It's one of my favorite places, and it's actually one of the finest museums in the world. So it's a privilege to not only be here, but also to be able to participate in the automotive community here in Northern California. I got my start in cars at the age of 11 when I bought the car that you're seeing here on the screen. That's me in 1973. I paid $1,500 for the car. I was so crazy for automobiles that I had no idea what was involved with them. I just loved looking at them, tinkering with them, and I was notorious for starting projects that I couldn't finish, taking things apart and frustrating my parents with cars that wouldn't start in the morning. Nevertheless, over time, I got a little older and I got better at fixing things. Cars fascinated me not just because of how they worked, but because of the way they looked. Somehow, at a fairly early age, I figured out that these cars had stories inside of them, and those stories would propel me deep into their history, deep into the people involved in the building of them, and deep into the cultural impact that automobiles have today. This one I finally finished restoring to Pebble Beach Standard in 2001. But it wasn't the only car I was privileged to have the opportunity to own. Over the years, I've owned several automobiles and not only had the privilege of showing them, but participating with a number of different individuals who restore them to meticulous levels of detail. Automobiles of all different shapes and sizes, this one being a Pegaso from Spain, and this one being a concept car from Dodge. Over the years, my tastes changed in terms of the cars I would own myself, but I was always passionate about roadsters, sports cars, post-war European coach-built cars, and the opportunity to not only study them, but occasionally restore them. This one was found in Lafayette, stored for over 35 years, in a man's garage that was the second owner. I happily restored it and enjoyed using it with my family. Other cars over the years led me to the understanding not only of the design of them, but the build of them. In 1979, as a senior in high school, I sat down and penned this design based on what would happen if Pegaso had stayed in business. It took five years of design and construction to build the automobile that I thought Pegaso should have built. Here you see the plaster mold, half of the body being designed and molded into shape before transferring it to the other side. I thought it would take about two years to completely build, but after a course of five years, I finally finished it. And when I say finish, that meant that it was complete. It would take another 11 years to actually make it reliable, functional, and drivable. That's a long time to build a car. Shortly after I completed that car, I decided that I wanted to do it the way the professionals did. After having graduated from UCLA with a degree in industrial design, I went to Art Center College of Design to study transportation design. There I learned what the professionals in the industry were talking about when they referred to the automobile as the surface, the reflections, all of the interfaces and details for surfacing involved in doing not just the exterior design, but interacting and interfacing with the interior as well. Over the course of my career, I was privileged to work with a number of different car companies designing and building cars through the 90s and early 2000s. Additionally, I spent a tremendous amount of time working as, a, as an illustrator for magazines and also, of course, scale model cars. Scale model cars offered me the opportunity to work on complete projects, but much smaller. So instead of taking 11 years, these cars would take anywhere between one and two years to complete to a high level of detail. Over the course of the years, I would do over three to 400 different individual scale model cars for nearly every company that produces them. In 2008, I had the opportunity to work on a unique concept for Ferrari involving the first hybrid mechanism for their designs. 
Instead of working with an existing platform, I had the opportunity to develop my own platform entirely. By then, I had mastered the use of digital tools and began working in detail on the engineering and the drivetrain package for this Ferrari. Completed entirely as a digital project, the renderings you see here are only, ex only exist inside the computer. All of the body designs and details were figured out and fabricated digitally, and the entire car can be printed using 3D printing today. Other concept vehicles I worked on were opportunities to stretch the limitations, try new things in the industry, and visit back to the past to recreate some ideas using thoughts and period pieces that existed some times ago. And of course, hot rods. Hot rods are unique to the American culture and an integral part of the automotive development in our industry today. So that's my brief story of how I got here. Now let's talk about how we all got here. In the mid-1800s, trains began traversing our geography. While offering the opportunity for people to go to many places across the country, trains would not get to the United States until the end of the 1800s, offering passenger travel. By the 1900s, automobiles were just beginning to be invented and developed. The primary means of transportation at the time was the horse and buggy. Using these cars or these vehicles as primary visual opportunities to develop the car, we began to see carriages develop, self-powered carriages, as in this Oldsmobile. Of course, these were mostly handmade vehicles. They took a long time to make, and they were expensive. It wouldn't be until this car here, the 1908 Model T Ford, that all that would change. Now, we all know the story of how the Model T Ford came to be and the fact that it indeed helped create the middle class. That's not quite true. It didn't create the middle class. It ushered in the opportunity for people to strive for a middle class. One of the things that was happening at the time, very interesting and not unusually different from what's happening today with digital tools, the vehicle was developing, but the infrastructure to support it was not. The weight of the vehicles and the consistency of occurrence over and over and over again in the same spots created ruts in the road that made obvious challenges for driving. So in addition to the automotive industry having to innovate, we also had to innovate the road industry. Over time, these vehicles would play an integral role in the development of the automobile, and our interstate highway system would progress so that newer automobiles could develop, more luxurious appointments could be put in place, tire development would be significant, and of course, throughout all of our industries, we would begin to see the overlap between what was happening in trains and automobiles, and as well as aircraft and seagoing vessels. Our interstate highways began to be the opportunities for young people to explore and discover as part of our United States expansion. We would not only see those opportunities in our vehicles, we would see them in the dreams of tomorrow. Here's one of the pre-war uh, concept cars Harley Earl developed called the Buick Y-Job. This is considered the first uh, concept car to help inspire and create a vision for the future around the vehicles of tomorrow. All of that would change, of course, dramatically during World War II, where all of our resources would be focused and put towards building the arsenal that we would need in order to end the war. So it would take several years and many, many lives. One of the opportunities that came out of World War II was the training and development and skills for young people, not only in working with metal, working with electronics, and working with communication. Here we see a couple of people working in welding, which was one of the primary skills that was required. You'll notice that he's holding a, a rod in one hand and a hot torch in the other hand. Not surprisingly, that rod heated up, and people who came back with those skills had to do something with those skills. 
So they became known as hot rodders. The hot rodders of the time would weld and cut their cars, but they weren't able to weld and cut the cars of contemporary design. So they worked on the ones from the past. So we begin to see these modified vehicles substantially changed from their older designs into new ways of thinking. Further informed by those times, the aircraft that the young people worked on would become the inspirations for the vehicles of the future. We would see these inspirations throughout the development of the automobile, and we would use them as ways to excite production cars and also work with cars of the future. Can you even see the car in there? Our obsession with speed and performance would reach a pinnacle when Chuck Yeager would, would fly the uh, Bell X-1 at the speed of sound, and that would become the opportunity not only for us to utilize aircraft technology in contemporary vehicles, but jet engine technology and turbine technology. During this time, the industry itself also expanded. Artisans and draftsmen began to merge together. Draftsmen had formerly been separate from the artist, art and craft of designing cars. Now they were being blended together, and designers and sculptors worked in harmony, creating the vehicle forms that would be molded and turned into production cars. This was very different from what was happening in Europe, where these methods had basically been following traditions using hand-hammered forms and aluminum to create the shapes that you see in European coachwork. In addition to what was happening in the stratosphere, we were flying jets, we were also fascinated with, with, with what was happening under sea. Undersea exploration was a key part of our, our ambitions for the future. During this time, roughly the late 50s through the early 60s, Designs of automobiles were inspired by marine creatures. We see this in a number of different vehicles, not only in the vehicle designs themselves, but in the trim and details. Here you see Bat 7, highly influenced by the shapes and forms of aquatic creatures that were being discovered during undersea explorations. This was not only in Europe, it was happening in the United States as well. Shortly thereafter, we began a new level of interest from undersea exploration into, of course, outer space exploration. During this time, advanced computers would be developed and the automobile industry would incorporate computer use inside the technology of automobiles during the late to mid, uh, mid to late 60s. These vehicles were designed with an intense amount of expression toward the future, that forward level of thinking going out toward where places we'd never gone before and imbuing those design ideas inside automobiles. Today, this occurs throughout our product designs. We see the vehicle forms in so many different ways, but the objects of our consistent and permanently embedded visual architectures are reflected in the vehicle forms we see today. Automobile design is always informed by the actions and activities of the future informed deeply by what's happening currently in our technology. So we see some of the most advanced vehicle forms and design ideas today informing us and inviting us into the future. Or do we? Here's the same prototypical design from 1927. Design today is informed highly by the opportunity to integrate technology into our vehicles. Here we have one of the most sophisticated entertainment devices being utilized in the automobile today. Back then we had one of the most sophisticated entertainment devices incorporated in the automobile of the day. So we see these opportunities, these dreams of a tomorrow, the ideas of flying cars, all still imbued in our technology and our desire for the future. Flying cars may, in fact, be an opportunity today. For decades, we've used the automobile as a way to understand our future. Young people 
have used it as a way for discovery, emancipating themselves from their existing environment and challenge their, challenging their own family geography by moving away from the places where they grew up. Seeking the future as families, adventures, and the products of those times, even something as simple as, as a bicycle, being designed with ideas about the automobile for young people. For years, men and women worked together with the automobile as part of family life. And the aspirations of what we might achieve in the automobile became a significant part of our future. Today, we see these forms and vehicle, vehicle designs intersecting with fashion. Here we see the BMW Gina prototype using fabric as the body material. Technology, of course, is a big part of how we redesign our interiors. Lighting, LED fixtures, three-dimensional displays, and of course, composites and clear composites that are stronger than some metals today used in vehicle designs. The dreams of tomorrow are still with us today. When we step behind the windshield or we get behind the windshield of that car and look out on the highway of the future, what we see before us is an opportunity to discover, to enjoy the future and to be a part of it as it unfolds in front of us. This sort of discovery through the automobile is still a key and critical part of what's happening today. And we see it with our young people. Only we see it a little bit differently. Today, the windscreen of the automobile is the laptop of the future. Young people are using their screens as a way to emancipate themselves, much as we did the actual automobile many years ago. Young people today spend significant time using their screens for fun and for education. It is their way of understanding the future. It is their way of discovering and emotionally emancipating themselves from their families. Concurrent with that, we see that young people have stopped driving. And the reason these statistics are down are pretty detailed. We'll get into one of the main reasons shortly. But it's interesting to note that at the peak of li driver's licenses being issued was 1983. Driver's license issues have gone down precipitously. We're down to now about 50% of where we were back in 1983. Costs of vehicles have gone up dramatically. An average American sedan hides about $9,000 worth of additional annual costs. This is money many young people can't afford. So they're doing different things and they're changing their behaviors to where the automobile is becoming less and less significant as part of their life and lifestyle. So where do we go to the future? What does it look like for us in this ever-changing environment? The automobile, of course, is always informed by the technology of the times. What does the technology of the times look like today? Today, one of the most significant advancements in automotive technology is the hybrid. Hybrid and electric vehicles are increasing in production dramatically. By 2020, we'll have more than double the, op double the options of purchasing opportunities with electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles. Now, that doesn't mean a lot when you look at the total overall picture, but that will continue to grow as hybrids become more and more popular and young people need vehicles that are at a lower cost option. Hybrids and electric cars are being designed and developed today, not as sedans primarily, but as young or youth-minded vehicles with opportunities to not only save money, but save the environment, save fuel, and still offer plenty of fun. Youth-based vehicle design is a significant part of the growth and opportunity in hybrid vehicles. More and more of the concepts we see today are being pitched toward young people and young people are paying very close attention to the technology of the times. One of the most important features technologically for the future of the automobile will be nanoparticles and nanomaterials. Here we see an example whereby one of the biggest problems with automobiles being the weight of the battery, 
Here, the battery is actually the body of the car. Using nanomaterials molded into the, fra the frame, subsupport, and skin of the vehicle, you're allowed to have the opportunity to use those very, very strong nanomaterials as a means of generating electricity. In fact, the applications of nanoparticles go far beyond the automobile industry and include many industries, including biomed, healthcare, and textiles. The dreams of the future with automobiles that are concept cars that we see shown, one-off cars that express the ideas and technology of the future, are no longer the future. They are here. Here we show uh, two BMW vehicles, the i3 and i8. And the i8, it's important to note, is parked underneath a solar car carport. The solar carport allows that vehicle to be charged fully off the grid, from sun to electricity to the vehicle. That is a complete zero uh, emission vehicle without any impact to our current electrical grid. Granted, this is a $100,000 car, but given time, that will improve. Not only time, but significant companies that are investing substantially in the future of the automobile. Google is our one of our leading tech companies, and they're fascinated with the idea of the driverless vehicle. The driverless car of the future is something we've talked about many, many times in the industry, but it's becoming more and more important. The average American spends two hours per day in their vehicle. Commuting times are increasing dramatically. This map shows a saturation of commute times, and you can see the very highly saturated dark blue areas are for people that have a commute of 30 minutes or more one way. Our freeways are getting congested, not just crowded, but they're not moving. Again, 38 hours per year spent idling in traffic by an every individual American. That's a statistic from the National Highway and Tra uh, Traffic Safety Administration. 38 hours per year. There are 300 million people in the United States. You do the multiplication and you find out that that means there's 11.5 billion hours in the United States annually sitting there waiting for Google to advertise to you. <laughs> Incidentally, if you Google the word advertising, 1.7 billion hits comes up on Google. That's twice as many as if you Google God. So much like we were informed by the vehicle forms that surrounded us during various times in our history, so too today, the automobile is deeply informed by the designs of our current pervasive technology. Indeed, the future of automobile design will be deeply linked not only to the technology that is around us, but the behaviors we exhibit with those technologies and the desires we have to transport ourselves from today into the future. Thank you very much. And I'd love to take questions from the audience. So if you guys have any questions about, uh, yeah, sure. Wow, the four or five most beautiful production cars produced over the past, how many years? Ever? Ever, wow. <laughs> Ever. Okay. All right, we'll start pre-war. That would be the Van Buren bodied Bugatti Type 57. Gorgeous automobile sold to a Middle Eastern gentleman and then later returned to the United States. Uh, it would have to be the Alfa Romeo uh, Type 33 Stradale. Gorgeous automobile. Uh, let's see, Scaglioni design, I believe. Uh, Ferrari, 
250 Lusso, 1962, front uh, engine 12 cylinder car, Pininfarina design. Uh, where am I? I'm supposed to pick five, right? Okay. Ah, personal favorite of mine, uh, the American uh, Studebaker Avanti, 1964. One of my all time favorites and a, a deep personal connection uh, to that car. Uh, and I have one more. Uh, that would have to be uh, the Lamborghini Miura. Oh. Well, I was further away than I should have been when Rafi came to an end. So <laughs> sorry about that. That's all right. Um, what we like to do at, at this point with a speaker series is ask the presenter six questions um, about his uh, automotive passion and likes. So, um, you ready for this? I think so. So, um, well, I, Garth, I think you may have beaten me to it. What are your top five favorite cars uh, of all time? So, well, I, think they, I think beautiful yeah, I and favorite. <laughs> I think I was beaten by that. Okay, one, so. all right. Um, if you had to choose only one of those five cars, which one would it be? Oh, the Alfa Romeo, undoubtedly. It's a fantastic automobile. It was built in the, in the mid-60s, and that car was a mid-engine design, which was quite new during the time. Mid-engine designs were being used primarily for racing. And during that time period, racing cars were not just developed with existing technology. They were developed with uh, a certain amount of uh, anger and competition and aggressiveness that, that doesn't exist today. We've, uh, we've emboldened our technology to do all our hard work for us. So we rely on cars to do that, uh, which is one of the reasons why I'm very passionate about automobiles from the 50s and 60s. Uh, these cars were informed by our physicality, by our drives, our passions, and, and, and our, our willingness to take risks and, and adventure with those vehicles. Today, those risks are tremendously mitigated by technology. Of course, that offers us a, a significant amount of safety, um, reliability, durability, and uh, substantial cost savings in maintenance. That's a long answer, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, next question, which car would you like to drive coast to coast? Whether a leisurely Route 66 or a Cannonball Run style? Oh, it would probably have to be the uh, 1962 Ferrari GTO. Uh, they built uh, 30, maybe 32 of them. And uh, these cars currently sell for around $50 million a piece. Uh, I think it would be delightful to drive a $50 million car across the country. <laughs> just to I, say that I, I did. I suspect that's the Cannonball Run style yeah, version of yeah, cross country. Yeah, just to say it. <laughs> um, if you could, which automotive personality from history would you like to meet, whether over lunch or to go for a drive with? Uh, I'd have to take Enzo Ferrari out to lunch. And uh, of course, it would be Italian food. Uh, actually, I'd, I might bring him here because there are quite a few Ferraris here. But it, it would be Enzo Ferrari. I think he's a fascinating individual. Again, um, totally self-directed and passionate about his craft. Uh, that type of uh, insistence uh, for excellence, both in performance and, and beauty, uh, I think is admirable. Uh, which automotive venue or event would you wish to visit or attend? Oh, uh, Retromobile in Paris. Uh, in fact, I'm trying to convince my wife, Carolyn, to go uh, next year. Uh, I've, I've tried that. Honey, would you like to go to Paris? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I would start the question. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, good luck. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll share you what worked for me and what didn't work, if you like. <laughs> But uh, well, well worth the visit. Uh, last question. Which is your most cherished automotive artifact? Wow. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, two come to mind immediately, and they're, they're very different. Uh, I'll share both. One of, is, of course, the first place trophy from Pebble Beach. Uh, that had been a dream of mine for quite some time, so to have achieved it, um, is really something that I think important. Um, but probably more important than that, and uh, somewhat sentimentally, would be a, a small leather uh, wrapped bag of hand tools that my father used to fix his cars. I think that that would probably be it. 
Okay. Uh, now we're going to reopen it up to the floor, and um, I'm the one with the microphone. So if you want to put your hand up, I'll try my way quickly. Quick question about your first car. What yeah. was that, and how did you come to acquire it? Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, uh, it, it's a 1953 Jauer, and Jauer built automobiles. It was founded by uh, Alberto Taraschi in Italy, uh, and it, it was a small car company, so they didn't build many cars. Uh, their total production was about uh, 50 or 60 automobiles, and they were used primarily for road racing. Uh, the car came to the United States uh, via a gentleman named Chalmers Hall, who imported it uh, in 1959. He owned it for several years and then sold it to Walter Walton, uh, who sold it to me in 1973. I found it in an ad uh, in the LA Times magazine. I grew up in Southern California, and uh, it said, for sale, little red car. <laughs> Looks like Ferrari. <laughs> and uh, I convinced my dad to go with me to look at the car. And uh, uh, at the time, I had about $800. Um, he, uh, he spotted me the other money. Uh, the total purchase was $1,500. Um, on the way home, he informed me that it wasn't a gift and that in order to repay the debt, I would either A, have to earn straight A's in school, or B, pay every semester that I didn't. It didn't seem to be that difficult a task, but uh, if you've ever tried to bowl 300, it's extremely difficult. Uh, so it would take me almost two years to get all A's in school, but it worked, um, despite the fact that I had to pay uh, about three or $400 <laughs> on the way there. Yeah, hi, Rafi, thank you. I was wondering, uh, the car of the future, uh, the driverless car of the future, Will it be piloted by a GPS or a magnetic strip, or how do you see that? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, there have been two main developments in driverless vehicles over the past uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, the magnetic strip technology is, has been the one that's been fairly pervasive, but GPS technology has replaced it in the past decade simply because the devices that we've utilized um, in our phones and in our uh, vehicle navigation, and in most of our commercial navigation, the prices uh, for development of those things have dropped dramatically. Infrastructurally, GPS is much, uh, much cheaper than magnetic strip, and it doesn't involve having to redesign uh, most of our roadways. So my guess is pretty confidently that we'll see driverless vehicles using GPS navigation uh, as part of their technology. It's not 100% by any means today. Um, California is one of five states that have passed the law to allow uh, driverless vehicles to drive on uh, highways today, so they're out there. Uh, make sure you, you drive carefully with them. Uh, <laughs> uh, and they're not perfect yet. They, they do funny things like uh, swerve dramatically when they see uh, pieces of paper, flat paper lying in the road. Uh, they, they stop for pedestrians that are in the street, but but they don't, oh, thank you, shall we dance? <laughs> uh, they stop for pedestrians in the street, but they will not stop for a police officer that's standing there trying to wave at you. <laughs> so we'll have to arm all police officers with a, a badge that uh, can be identified by driverless vehicles. Uh, additionally, they, they don't offer what's called haptic response during the driving experience, so you'll be inside the vehicle and when you're driving normally in control, when you pull the wheel to one side, your body is haptically ahead of that movement, so it knows it's happening. Um, if, you're, if you don't get any pre-messages about that movement, uh, it can be extremely uh, disruptive to your equilibrium and also very hard on your, your body. Uh, so we have to figure out that as well, amongst other, many other things. Excuse me, mood music for a little bit. <laughs> Thank you, Nora. Uh, first of all, you have a very. First of all, you have a very uh, keen engineering mind in the background, and uh, so in a futuristic car, like 
30 years from now, what impact will the computers have on our cars besides driving by themselves? And so uh, the question was, in 30 years from now, so we're talking about roughly 2050, because automobile design and development that's going to be out in four to five years is currently in process now, and that's what I know about. So uh, in 2050, in addition to driverless vehicles, we'll have vehicles that are fully connected uh, all the time, 100%, um, to uh, infrastructure that is part of our basic uh, daily behavior. So your vehicle will be connected to uh, service industries, including um, restaurants, um, performance venues, uh, your job, um, and um, uh, for leisure travel, also connected to bed and breakfasts, hotels, things like that. So the connectivity will become an integral part of the vehicle. We'll have uh, independent devices that will uh, interact directly as part of the vehicle. Uh, it will not be very long in the future uh, before we see uh, Google either purchasing uh, a vehicle uh, manufacturing company and making their own vehicles. Uh, I think that's probably going to happen within the next decade. So the Google vehicle will be deeply informed uh, by young people's behaviors utilizing uh, digital technology. Uh, additionally, we'll see uh, uh, pretty aggressive development in uh, growable uh, materials on vehicles, so tires that will regenerate. Um, overnight, you park them, and like a battery that would get more juice, you park the vehicle and the tire will get more material. Um, you'll see seat technology that will be an integral part of uh, your medical condition, so it will monitor your health and it'll monitor your, uh, if you have a specific uh, medical condition involving uh, lower back pains or uh, certain things that require therapy, the vehicle will participate in that as well. And then, of course, uh, most of our entertainment will be fully integrated into the automobile. Uh, the windshield and windscreen and the looking out on uh, the scenery of tomorrow uh, will be less important. It's, uh, it's more important over the course of the next 20 to 30 years uh, to most of our industries that we look at the industry and not at the scenery. Hey, Rafi, really hey, enjoying this. Um, so what do you think the future is for the internal combustion engine? Excellent question. So it's, it's hard to argue with the, um, with the inherent efficiencies afforded by the internal combustion engine. Uh, right now, what we're seeing is we're seeing a period in time that is extremely unique. Uh, we have more oil than we've ever had before. Our oil consumption has gone down dramatically, particularly in the United States. And with new oil finding technologies, politics aside, you've, you've got a great deal more uh, of domestic oil available today. Internal combustion engines have advanced tremendously over the past decade. However, in 1987, Honda made an internal combustion motor that got roughly 55 to 60 miles to the gallon in a standard production automobile you can still get that type of mileage with a production gas burning automobile. But right now, more and more people are interested in uh, fuel that is either off the grid or part of the electric grid. I don't think we'll ever see the complete demise within the next 50 years of the internal combustion engine, but we're going to see more mixed fuel uh, options. We're gonna see more uh, experiments with uh, fuel cells and uh, also compressed gas um, uh, engine designs. Good morning. Good morning. You drew a distinction between the common wisdom of the Model T creating the uh, middle class, and you said that it afforded an opportunity to strive toward a middle class. Where do you draw that dividing line, and, and what's kind of what's behind that? Uh, this is a new yeah. new thing that I've not heard about before. Yeah. So. Uh, the middle class was already in, in, in motion. We were beginning to see signs of that. But what the Model T did was it afforded people the opportunity to have an object of desire that would take them outside of their current condition. And that is, that is ultimately what became the method uh, to motivate the middle class, the object of desire taking them out of their existing condition. 
uh, the Model T did that. It not only transported you physically, it transported you financially. And again, with all major movements, they occur with behaviors. The objects of our industry uh, during the Industrial Revolution changed our behaviors. So with a home, uh, people became more and more interested in fixing that home. And so after the Second World War, behaviors associated with making your home better by yourself and the self-directed do-it-yourself movement was in tremendous swing. So the Model T really started all of the ambitions and hopes and dreams of moving not just yourself physically, but moving your family uh, to a different place. And that kind of physicality became the behaviors that people began thinking about changing their lives financially, changing their lives with greater ambition, informing their children about schools, and using school and education as a way to advance their dreams. So what cars of today do you think will become the classics of tomorrow? Ah, that's a great question. A true investor. So the cars of today that will be classics of tomorrow, uh, pretty consistently throughout uh, classic car collecting, um, the cars that get the most attention, number one, cars that they built few of. So it can't be really a production-based automobile. Second thing would be cars that have unique uh, engineering or performance specifications. And the third would be cars that were desired substantially more so than the other vehicles of the time. So you could go through and plug in pretty much every main uh, sort of supercar into that equation. Most of the Ferraris and some of the Lamborghinis, though not all, uh, would fit in that equation. For American cars, you'd have to pick vehicles that Believe it or not, they did not make many of, or if they did make many of, for some reason, most of them are gone. So frightening as it may be, the Pontiac Aztec. <laughs> will be a vehicle that will be eventually in a museum, and it will be studied by many people who will wonder about it, <laughs> much as we do today. But because they didn't make many of them, and because it was a failed uh, experiment in design and execution, um, it, will, it will be collected for that unique curiosity. How many Aztecs do I own? <laughs> I, I think that may be a transportation museum as opposed to a classic car museum. Yeah. yeah. The question of Bob. Could you say a few things, both positive and negative, about the integration of non-driverless vehicles and driverless vehicles over, say, the next 20, 25 years? So that's a great question. I, I, I believe pretty strongly that we will never, and it's difficult to say never because, well, they said 100 years ago that mankind will never drive faster than 100 miles an hour in an automobile because their head would explode. <laughs> so I do, I do not believe we will... Uh, have a planet that is completely populated by driverless vehicles. And the reason why is because mankind did something very, very unique thousands and thousands of years ago. We tamed an animal for our transportation. And that is in our basic biology. There's something about that. Our drive, our desire to tame the horse and then control that wild animal was uh, something that I have to believe was, was a deep part of our biology. And I think that is what we see with automobiles today. The idea that you would sit passively behind uh, the wheel of a vehicle and allow it to take you somewhere is, is an opportunity of convenience afforded by the behaviors of today's technology. We sit behind the screen of the computer and we hope it to take us places. So we're, we're enchanted by that idea, but very, very soon we're going to um, we're going to find a revolt about it. And during that revolt, we will return to some of sort of our basic drives and desires. And I think that that is going to be happening and that is a big part of why driver vehicles will always be a part of our, our uh, transportation geography. The opportunity to control, when I say control, it's not in a demanding way, uh, it's in a mutual exchange way. 
So it's a partnership. My grandfather, for example, would speak about uh, him having a relationship with his horse. So he would care for it, he would uh, bathe it, he would brush it, groom it, and uh, make sure that it was taken care of medically. That was transferred to my father, who would speak about taking care of his car in a way that was odd to me. I wouldn't understand it completely because he simply transferred the educational behaviors from watching his grandfather deal with the horse to him working with the automobile. I, in turn, transferred it to my passion for cars, um, a little bit informed by um, my education from watching my father take care of his vehicle. Today, we see young people taking care of their digital devices in a way we can't quite understand. <laughs> how that will embody itself and how they take care of other appliances, well, we'll we'll find out in about 30 to 40 years. What is your everyday driver? And what is your favorite car to drive in your collection? Oh, OK. So my, my current everyday driver is a Honda Accord Hybrid. It's a great four-door car, wonderful, reliable. If, if you want a reliable car, buy a Honda. Honda is not an automobile manufacturer. They are an engine manufacturer. And because that is their core uh, competency, they build their automobiles around the idea that the engine must never, ever embarrass the company. So that's why Honda automobiles are built the way they're made. And they are phenomenal, phenomenal cars. My favorite car to drive, uh, that would be, uh, uh, in my current collection, would be the uh, 67 Ghia 450 SS. It's uh, convertible, and it's great to put the top down, pull it out of the garage, and just go for a drive. Okay, two more questions, if there's anybody. You mentioned earlier about hybrid fuels. Do you see a future for HHO-powered vehicles? Hmm. Well, any, any of the uh, fuel requirements that are different from the current infrastructural opportunities are going to be difficult to integrate into our transportation geography. One of the biggest problems with the electric car today is range because the batteries will run out and it takes time to charge your car. So what we'll be seeing in the future is just like we have gas stations where you pull into a fuel station and you put more fuel in the car, in the future you'll see where we pull into fuel stations, you'll remove your battery and you'll put in a freshly charged one and you'll continue on your way. So that type of infrastructure, um, if it can be developed and it has a monetizable model uh, for development, then it will include uh, alternative fuel opportunities, including alternative fuels like uh, compressed gas vehicles um, um, and uh, uh, additional hybrid gas electric vehicles uh, that utilize different models from the current structure today. Right, hold on. You brought up an interesting point regarding uh, changing out batteries. Where do you see the, uh, how, how do you see the direction of that going? Because it means we'll have to have auto manufacturers agree on a, uh, a common battery package. Yeah, that's, that's probably going to happen. Uh, it took several years for automobile manufacturers to agree on the common fuel. Um, we were, um, at the turn of the century, 1900s, we had more electric vehicles than we did uh, gasoline-powered ones. Uh, there were more than 1,000 companies making electric cars uh, in 1910, 1911. And uh, so petrochemicals were not refined enough. We didn't have the industry and the refinement capacity to be able to deliver on those promises. What we did have and what we owe our future to back then was uh, the agricultural equipment that was being developed at the time. So the internal combustion engine that uh, powered the tractors that was helping to feed our nation was uh, purloined for use in rural areas because farmers needed to get back and forth um, to sell their wares uh, into the cities, and that was how they were doing it. So petrochemicals uh, became a significant part of it and developed the infrastructure uh, to match uh, uh, that demand. So the demand for electric cars today is roughly, uh, it's about 9% right now. So that's a pretty small number, but it is growing. 
and I think the opportunity to consolidate into a singular or uh, multiple package of batteries uh, that are common uh, will occur. We, we've yet to see it substantially advance in our consumer electronics as everybody is frustrated by taking the battery out of one object and looking at why it's a different shape from the other. But there are different reasons for that and I think you'll see uh, some unique battery manufacturing opportunities consolidate over the course of the next uh, decade. So I'd like to ask one last question. Would you be available to tour the lower gallery with any of the guests that wanted to stay around afterwards? Sure, I'd be delighted to do that. I did Wonderful. make a promise to a couple of friends that I would walk them through the gallery today. Uh, anyone is more than welcome to join us. Okay. Um, Rafi, thank you very much. Thank you.